Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast as we head into our final segment of the day. This morning, we got the news that Joel Embiid and the Philadelphia 76ers have agreed to a three-year, $193 million max contract extension. This is a situation where he was already going to be under contract through the 2026-27 season. So, you know, definitely... A little bit premature here to some degree, but they this also the way that it fully breaks out actually it doesn't it actually only adds an extra two years on top of that. It gives them a slight uh, a slight increase in pay in that 26-27 season. It adds on one more fully guaranteed season in 2027-28, and then a player option in 28-29. So he's going to be making in that $60 million range per year during those three seasons, assuming he, and I'm assuming he will, uh, take on that player option considering he'll be 34 years old and will have 69 million dollars waiting for him so I would think that that's pretty hard to pass up on but you know we'll see the reality of the situation is is that Embiid we all understand how excellent he is and how games missed are a massive part of his career up to this point where It is definitely disappointing that we haven't gotten to see what the true peak of Embiid's powers look like when he is fully healthy in the playoffs, but we know how excellent he is. So, while I do feel like, again, this was maybe a slightly premature move from them, at the end of the day, the 76ers understand that Embiid is the best player that they've had since Allen Iverson, you could go even maybe a little bit before that as well. I don't want to dive into that whole argument there. Um, not something that I want to have. Probably fans on both sides of that argument mad at me to some degree. But the 76ers, I think that the biggest thing for them is just the fact that they want to have no drama coming into the season. Last year, obviously, the James Harden saga was a big-time distraction going into the year, and they quickly move off of that to be able to just sort of move around pieces, get some expiring deals, and prepare themselves for having cap space for this past off season, which they then use to sign Paul George. And it was a signing that, you know... I feel like more NBA fans than I was expecting were out on this idea of them signing Paul George. I think it was kind of a no-brainer move given that, yeah, is Paul George a perfect player? No, but the reality is how often do you get players that are caliber of All-NBA in free agency? And I do say that with Paul George, it's not that he was All-NBA last year, but for a lot of the season, he was at least in the conversation. And the 76ers aren't going to need Paul George to go out and make an All-NBA team. This is just about the idea of they need a more consistent third option because as we saw last year and we've seen for years, Tobias Harris was very clearly not that. Now you have Tyrese Maxey who's emerging, but and, and as much as I like Tyrese Maxey and I think that he brings a ton to the plate in terms of, you know, shot creating ability, just his speed in the transition game is excellent. A perfect pick and roll partner with Joel Embiid. But that being said, he's not somebody that necessarily is going to be able to shoulder a massive workload with a high success rate in terms of wins and losses. And not yet, at least. And, you know, I think that a lot of people get very defensive over Tyrese Maxey. And I, again, I want to make it very clear that I am a big fan of Maxey. He's still just 23 years old. He has an extremely bright future ahead of him. The reality of the situation is, and not that I'm holding it against him necessarily himself because there were a lot of other flaws on the roster, but when you talk about the minutes that Tyrese Maxey played himself without Joel Embiid, both in the regular season and more specifically in the playoffs, the 76ers offense was just not good. And that is a situation that they needed to have another star to throw out there. And Paul George has definitely had his share of injury concerns as well over recent seasons, which isn't exactly a great sign considering you're throwing him with Joel Embiid, who obviously has his own issues. But 
I think that at this point now, PG can sort of be a third option. I would assume that's the way the pecking order is going to go here. And this idea of, you know, Paul George in a lot of ways, I would argue, is a lot of what Tobias Harris was, but at a higher level, where Tobias never had the shot-creating ability necessarily. I mean, I can't say never. There were definitely some years early on with him that I was a very, very big fan of Tobias, but we would all agree that Paul George is significantly better with the ball in his hands, but just the idea that he can be this swing man that can take on, you know, high-end defensive responsibilities for whatever it's worth. I thought that Tobias Harris did pretty well, all things considered, on the defensive side of the ball. Offense, obviously not. Um, and 76ers fans were, you know, packing his bags for him for probably a couple of years, but especially after that closeout performance where he was abysmal offensively, and not even abysmal, it's just that he was invisible way too often for Philadelphia. That Paul George, he's going to make his presence felt, and I think in a positive light. Paul George sort of has this reputation with a lot of NBA fans that he's not clutch, that he can't carry an offense. Well, he's not going to be asked to in this situation. The idea is that Joel Embiid is going to be fully healthy, knock on wood there, and that they can sort of just have these other pieces that can play off of them, knock down the open shots, you know, and just add different elements to the game. And the big three era feels like it's a little bit dead in the NBA, especially under the new collective bargaining agreement and how heavily teams are taxed for going over the luxury tax that it, it feels like it's sort of a thing of the past. It's not often that you have this much cap space and you are able to invest it immediately into a star caliber player. And I do still think that Paul George is that, even if he's not, you know, the emerging superstar that he was with Indiana or when he was top three in the MVP voting, when he was with Oklahoma City, that sure, he has his blemishes on his resume, but this is a chance where he can sort of just be refined in his own skills and not feel like he has to overcompensate for other things because there's more than enough talent on that Philly roster between the the three of them. But then also, I feel like they did a pretty good job of at least finding other talent around there. They had gotten Kelly Oubre on a vet minimum last season. Now they re-up his deal, so it's making more money, but it's still under $8 million against the cap this upcoming season. I think that he gives you... Uh, very good two-way presence there. Somebody who can attack the rim for you a little bit as well. I loved what they did in the draft with Jared McCain and Adam Bona, two players that it's not like you're going to be super heavily leaning on them, but I think McCain's going to come into the NBA and he's going to be a shooter. I know, whatever. Like I'm not going to take anything out of Summer League. I know there were maybe some inconsistencies at times there, but I feel like McCain sort of relishes the idea of having the target on his back. He eats it up. Sure, he does, you know, TikTok and everything. And he understands that it's going to come with some level of scrutiny, fair or not. But I think that he sort of, you know, internalizes it in a way where he wants to prove you wrong. And trust me, playing at college campuses in the ACC probably, you know, heard his very fair share of chirps and he put together an an incredible freshman season. Bona is somebody where maybe a little bit on the shorter end for a big man, but I think he's going to be a very reliable defensive presence. We saw, you know, on both sides of the ball, it was when Embiid was out. I thought that they were at least going to be able to stay alive on defense while he was out with having Bamba and Paul Reed, but it clearly did not end up being the case. Bona is somebody that if they can get 10 good minutes out of them a game, I think that that's overall a, a pretty good sign for them. And it's not like they're an extremely deep roster, but, you know, they have their combination of veterans. They bring in a number of, you know, veteran names this offseason. Drummond, Reggie Jackson, Eric Gordon. They had brought in Kyle Lowry during the season last year, where overall, I mean... 
it's maybe slightly thin. Caleb Williams is another name that I haven't mentioned yet as well, that they have, I think, more spacing than they did last year. I think that they have a little bit more depth as well. And I think that they're going to be in the mix with everything. Now, obviously, the East at the top will be better, I believe, this season in comparison to what it was last year. The Celtics remain the Celtics, but last year it took just 50 wins to take the two seed, which was the Knicks, but I think that the Knicks got better. I know that, you know, it seems like a lot of the NBA community is just out on the Bucks and that Doc Rivers isn't the guy and that they are sort of screwed long term, but I think that this is a situation we are going into year two of Lillard and Giannis. I think they're going to have a better rapport this upcoming year. When you talk about a two-man game that could break the league, they never found that last season, and injuries were part of it. Coaching was part of it as well, I think. And I think that they are going to be able to really bounce back. They We saw drastic defensive improvements with that roster throughout the course of the league when, or uh, throughout the course of the year, once they moved from Adrian Griffin to Doc Rivers. Now he has a full season with all of them. Damian Lillard, you know, Doc revealed it. It was a little bit controversial, at least for some fans, when Doc mentioned it on the Bill Simmons podcast that Lillard was in the worst shape of his career headed into last season because he knew a trade was imminent and he didn't want to risk getting injured. So now I would assume at least that he's coming back stronger this upcoming season. And, you know, I think it's really the top four there, but even as well, you look at an Indiana who I, a lot of people are chalking that up to a run built off of injuries. Did injuries help them? Sure. But They're a super competitive team. You know, you just look up and down. I think that the East is actually in better shape, specifically in that top six, seven-ish, where you could throw the Cavaliers in there as well, pressing the reset button slightly with Kenny Atkinson, even though I do think that they are eventually going to have to make some changes with that roster, but maybe that's just me. And then the Orlando Magic, I feel like, are still maybe a bit of a ways away, but can ultimately get there as well. So I think the East is going to be a fascinating run here. I still feel like it's the Celtics is east until you know somebody comes and takes it from them but 76ers in a pretty good position headed into this season do i love the idea of having a 34 year old joel Embiid making 69 million dollars for you no not really but at the same time you know if if he's healthy he's as good as anybody else in the nba and that's ultimately the way that the 76ers have to look at this they understand that their championship window is probably these next 2 3 seasons that extends a little bit further i suppose the contract does than when i think they'll be fully there but you know they they have to sort of pour themselves into this current infrastructure and try and capitalize because they've been knocking on the door it feels like in terms of regular season success for years and are yet to even make it to a conference finals so they are thinking that this is the off season where they can really you know rejuvenate the franchise as a whole and get themselves back on track but you know only time will tell but let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section that is all the time we have for today thank you very much for the gsmc sports network to for allowing us to host this show remember to like follow subscribe wherever you keep up with us we will be back on monday afternoon same time as always at two o'clock p.m eastern we will see you then have a great weekend take care Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Yeah, damn, ain't that great? I don't wanna go.